Aloha, everyone. Hope you're having a glorious day. The book of Daniel contains the most incredible prophecy about the end of human empires. It's called Mystery Babylon, the final iteration of the oppressive, globalized, earthly empire of darkness ruled by Satan. So Daniel comes to God in this time of exile when Israel is in Babylon and reminds God there's only 70 years prophesied of exile in Babylon and they're almost up and he longs for home just like we long for our home in heaven. Earth is not our true home. This is uh, an oppressive empire of mystery Babylon. And what God reveals next to Daniel is one of the most stunningly accurate prophecies in all of the Bible. It's found in Daniel 9, 20 to 27. It's called the 70 weeks. Daniel's 70th week is broken in half. Three and a half years that have been fulfilled three and a half years that are yet to be fulfilled, that are remaining. And God's earthly timeline here was interrupted by grace for the church age and the fullness of the Gentiles to come in. Let's see God's calendar events still to come. So Daniel writes down this amazing prophecy. And archaeologists have recovered copies of Daniel 9, verified to be trans transcribed 150 years before Christ. And why is that so important? Because if it wasn't written down, you would think it was identifying Christ exactly to the year of Messiah. So it says 70 weeks have been determined. 70 weeks will bring an end to the earth's rebellion rescuing number one your people and number two your city and goes on to describe Christ's complete mission both first and second coming now a week is seven years see Jacob's week uh, of seven years to win Rachel and Leah um, so 70 times 7 equals 490 years so it's written very precise your people so Christ's first ministry, his, he, he provides individuals a way to the Father through him. And then it says, number two, your holy city, Christ's second coming, he redeems the earth for his heavenly kingdom to become his earthly kingdom. Then this prophecy goes on to say precisely when Messiah or Christ would come. There will be an order to rebuild Jerusalem seven weeks and 62 weeks, then Messiah, then the Christ. So this is a really weird way to say it, but let's summarize what has happened so far. A decree, you can read about this in Ezra 7, uh, and we know this happened exactly in 457 BC. So uh, 49 years later, Seven times seven. The temple is completed in 408 BC and exactly 434 years later, or 62 weeks, 60 time, 62 times seven, is 27 AD. And Christ announces his Messiahship and then fulfills his three and a half year ministry. Jesus even tells his mother, it's not my time yet. God will announce his messiahship at the exact timing. And so the temple is the archetype of God here on earth. And Jesus is, he called his body the temple, which was the final fulfillment of God here on earth. So in our Western culture, we are stuck in a Hellenistic mindset of time is linear, not cyclical and every single event is once and then completed, this is different from the minds of ancient Israelites. Hebraic mindset is of 
cyclical, seasonal, archetypal rehearsals until God fulfills His promise in His complete fulfillment. The second coming is the final fulfillment of an archetype of Noah's flood or God's wrath on the earth, which is to be finally fulfilled in its final fulfillment on the Feast of Atonement with Jesus' second coming. So Jesus is baptized at 30 years old. So when is this Messiahship announced? Well, John the Baptist and his followers knew it was the time for Messiah. Read John 1, 21, read Matthew eleven three, 3, read Luke 7, 19. There was Messiah fever in the air uh, because they knew this was the time that the prophecy said that Messiah would come. And Jesus' baptism is recorded in Luke three twenty two. It says, You are my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Now, Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. It's recorded right there. It's really easy. It's straightforward. So he starts his ministry of Messiahship at 30 years old. Now, before this time, he's always saying, it's not my time. He precisely is fulfilling this prophecy. But why 30 years old? Why does he start it at 30 years old? Well, Joseph was a prison slave and became second in command of Egypt at 30. Joseph, Joseph was the savior of his family and of the nations. Interestingly, the first time his family sees him, they don't recognize him, just like the Pharisees and the Jews don't recognize their Messiah. So he's, Joseph is this archetype of the final fulfillment of savior. Joseph is a savior archetype, Jesus is the final fulfillment of our Savior. Priests. Priests entered their service at 30. Just read Leviticus 4.3. David becomes king at 30. And Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is uh, King Jesus. And Ezekiel becomes, uh, is called to be a prophet at 30. God's word became flesh in Jesus. So Ezekiel, or all of the prophets, are the archetype of God's word here on earth. And then God's word actually became flesh in Jesus. In Matthew 10, 23, he says, I tell you the truth, you will not finish going through all of the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. And the very next event... Uh, recorded in John 11:5, he announces the Son of Man, Messiah, the one talked about in Daniel 9, has come. So the kingdom of God is here to replace man's kingdoms. This was uh, given, this prophecy was given to Daniel by God in Babylon. He was in Babylon at the time. And no doubt, Daniel would have shared this knowledge with other wise men from the East. So guess how the wise men used the sun, moon, and stars to know when Messiah would be born. A wise man could figure out when Messiah was born just by subtracting 30 years from the time this prophecy of his Messiahship had been predicted. After the Messiah comes, he will be cut off. So let's go on in Daniel 9 to understand this incredible prophecy. It says, an anointed one, the Messiah, will be cut off and have nothing. So the, then the end of the war or rebellion on God, led by the Antichrist, will come quick like a flood. Jesus and John the Revelator confirm the end as quick, like a flood. So Messiah will confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will end sacrifices and offerings. Now, I feel it's necessary to pause here for a Hebrew grammar lesson. So the Hebrew grammar rules uh, say that the antecedent 
the, this he right here, all the controversy is over this he. Is it Jesus? Is it Jesus Messiah, the anointed one? Or is this he, which Timothy LaHaye and uh, Hal Lindsey and C.I. Schofield and John uh, Darby uh, have all ascribed this to this he as to Antichrist, okay? The people are the Antichrist. So the grammar rules pro prohibit this. The antecedent goes back to the Messiah. The antecedent goes back to the Messiah. In verse 26, not a people or prince, not this, the people or prince, the Antichrist. The article the before the Messiah makes verse 27's he refer back to Messiah, who will confirm, not make, the covenant. In Hebrew, the proper noun is the Messiah, not a people or a prince, which are all improper nouns with no definite article. Therefore, the antecedent must go back to the proper noun Messiah. It cannot be translated back to a people or even to a prince. The grammar forbids it. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, Messiah will confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will end sacrifices and offerings. Okay, let's see what we got. So, we covered the first 69 weeks already. So, the last week of human history, the 70th week, which uh, began with Jesus' ministry of mess Messiahship, is the last seven years. The last seven years have some very specific events already fulfilled and some yet to be fulfilled. So in the middle of the week, uh, or 3.5 years, Messiah is cut off. What about the remaining 3.5 years till the end of history when Christ comes back? Well, let's find out. So Jesus confirms a covenant with many. So it, it says in Daniel 9, confirm a covenant for one week, seven years, in the middle of the week, he will bring sacrifices and offerings to a halt. Now, the New Testament is actually a translation of the new covenant, the new promise. Okay? So Christians celebrate it with communion. They celebrate this event with communion, the, the giving of the new covenant. So you can summarize, in fact, you can summarize the Bible in six words. Uh, Old, Old Testament or Old Covenant, Jesus is coming. New Testament or New Covenant, Jesus is here. Easy. All right, so in the middle of the week, in the middle of the seven years, Messiah, uh, uh, three and a half years into his ministry, brings sacrifices and offerings to a halt. Okay, so this is easy to understand. He gave up his spirit. The word there is pneuma at Passover. So the angel of death passes over us and does not take our spirit. Matthew 27, 50. So Jesus is offered as the perfect and final sacrifice, the final fulfillment of all sacrifices and offerings that have gone before. Now, would God care about sacrifices being offered once the perfect perpetual sacrifice has been offered? Some people make a big uh, deal about the third temple being built in Jerusalem and sacrifices will begin again on it. And I'm not saying that that can't happen or won't happen. I'm just saying, why would God care about sacrifices offered when this perfect sacrifice has already been offered? So put this all together. God is saying the first and second coming, the redeeming of individuals and the redeeming of the earth is interrupted by the church age. I have made an agreement or a, a covenant with many. They are my business partners to share with the world who God is and how he loves them. Then the end will come abruptly. This abrupt end is written about in Daniel 7, Daniel 12, Revelation 11, Revelation 12, Revelation 13. And every place, it only discusses three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week left. It, it calls it by different names. Time, times, and half a time. 
42 months or 1260 days, all of these equate to three hundred three and a half years. In Luke 4.18, Jesus quotes Isaiah 61 and tells those who are listening, he is here to redeem individuals, but stops quoting the passage when it speaks of the vengeance and pouring out of God's wrath, redeeming the earth. And Jesus also foreshadows the, the, la the, very, uh, the last very difficult three and a half years in Luke 4, 26. He says, I tell you the truth, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's days when the sky was shut up for three and a half years. And there was a great famine over all the land. So the great famine is yet to come. The birth pains, tribulation, and great tribulation described in the Olivet Discourse and Revelation. So there's three and a half years of Jesus' ministry leading up to his death and the spring feasts, then the church age. There's three and a half years leading up to Jesus' second coming to redeem the earth. So what is Jesus doing right now? Well, he's ruling the universe at the right hand of the Father. He's sending out the gospel. He's saving sinners. He's interceding on our behalf. See, the accuser, Satan, is overruled. As long as Jesus is at the right hand, he's overruled until the fullness of the Gentiles comes into the heavenly kingdom. He's also overseeing the churches. And what about this remaining three and a half years to be fulfilled? Well, let's read. What a terrible time of trouble it is. There has never been any like it. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, culminating in wrath. His followers are spared. So Jacob's descendants were brought into the promised land, which is the archetype of heaven. God's people are rescued to heaven at the last trumpet. How do the remaining fall feasts from Leviticus 23 and the remaining three and a half years of human history from Daniel 9 coincide? Well, we can harmonize these events with scripture. We can merge the fall feasts of Leviticus 23 and the remaining three and a half years of human history from Daniel 9 on a timeline. So speaking to a Samaritan woman, Jesus tells the disciples the work of the church to bring in the Gentiles until summer is complete. John 4, 34 records this. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to complete his work. Don't you say there are four more months. By the way, there's four months from Pentecost to the day of the Lord at the end of summer. So, uh, there are four more months, and then comes the harvest. I tell you, look up and see that the fields are already white for harvest. The one who reaps receives pay and gathers fruit for eternal life, so that, no, so that the one who sows and the one who reaps can rejoice together. For in this instance, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you did not work for. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. He's calling us as business partners during the church age. So this summer age, the end will come uh, in, in rapid succession, culminating with the fall feasts. Uh, so, you know that summer is near. Know that he is near. Know that summer is near. Know that the kingdom of God is near. And, um, and then it goes on to talk about that day and that hour no one knows. The, the Feast of Trumpets, the first to kick off the fall feast. He's referencing uh, the, the Feast of Trumpets. It will come like the days of Noah until the flood came and took them all away. In Daniel, it talks about his end will come speedily like a flood. Revelation, same thing. The woman in an attempt to sweep her away by a flood. So if you can no longer harvest fruit, 
con convert Gentiles in this world, the final fulfillment of the abomination of desolation has begun. So this is where we would be on the timeline um, at the end. You know summer is near. You know God and his kingdom, the kingdom of God, is near. This generation will not pass. This is what he's saying. And as for the Feast of Trumpets and the Fall Feast, the end will come speedily. The end of this church age, the end of the summer, uh, will come speedily, like Noah's flood. So harmonizing this with a link verse of trumpets from Leviticus 23 and speedily end uh, of Daniel 19 is this first Thessalonians verse. There are a lot of these, but here's another one from 1 Corinthians, harmonizing and linking the first fruits from Leviticus 23 with the speedy end in Daniel 9. Now, the best harmonizing link passage of the end that is poured out of Daniel, on Daniel, uh, recorded in Daniel 9, that comes like a flood, and the Feast of Trumpets from Leviticus 23, the last trumpet is the all of it discourse, the words of Jesus, three times recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And if you synthesize these together, it always goes in this order. Birth pains, tribulation, great tribulation. What are birth pains? Wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines and earthquakes. What's tribulation? Hatred, uh, killed because of Jesus' name, falling away, betray one another, false prophets mislead uh, many, um, lawlessness increases, love of many grows cold, the gospel is preached to all nations, and then the end, great tribulation, the abomination of desolation, the thing that causes disgust to God because the blood of Jesus is no longer received as the sacrifice for our sins. It says, Judea flee, days must be cut short or else everyone would be killed. False messiahs, false prophets, signs and wonders, sun, moon, darkened, uh, the stars fall, son of man on the clouds, the great trumpet at the feast of trumpets, and the elect are gathered. Now here's a really interesting point. The locusts mentioned in Revelation 9. Locusts come at the end of summer and they devastate crops, they devour the crops. So this is uh, a, another uh, easy clue as to where we are on the calendar. We're currently in the church age, but the end will come quick with birth pains, tribulation, great tribulation, and then the fall feast, the Trump, tr uh, feast of trumpets. So when humanity can no longer accept the truth and teachings of Jesus, the culture the oppressive empire is an abomination that causes desolation. It defiles the temple of God, which is Jesus and his followers. Jesus comes to say, I, do, I will dwell inside of you. You are my temple. The unclean, he calls himself the temple. The unclean blood of a swine sprinkled on his temple is uh, an oppressive evil uh, globalized empire of Satan and its culture and uh, its, its economy uh, that is foisted on the people that follow Jesus. So the events in Revelation co coinciding with the remaining fall feasts um, are easy to see in Revelation, which is another harmonizing link between these two passages. So we easily see trumpets in Revelation 19 and atonement in the continuance of 19, 11 to 21, and tabernacles in 21 to 6. So the, what precedes this, obviously, is uh, the birth pains, tribulation, great tribulation. So then the elect are gathered at trumpets, God's wrath is poured out at atonement, and the millennial reign, the complete and perfect reign on earth of Jesus at tabernacles, and then Satan's defeat, and then the great white throne judgment, 
and the new heaven and the new earth. And then the new Jerusalem descends. So heaven and earth become one. 